The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in list. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, for coordinating uh, this great webinar uh, today. Thank you to all our attendees that have joined us. Um, I know it's a, a, a busy time of the day right here in the middle of the day. Hopefully you take a minute to enjoy your lunch and learn a little bit. Um, my name is Jess Delmer, uh, who's speaking to you. As Charlotte mentioned, I'm a, a board member with PAC and just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, how this presentation is going to work today, for those of you that might not be familiar for, with PAC, we're going to start off with just a little bit of information about our organization, just a couple of minutes here in the beginning. And then we're just thrilled to have our guest speaker with us today, uh, Sonia Wilson, who is the author of Harry Situations, uh, which is a book. If you haven't read it, you definitely have to. It is uh, it's a it's a fantastic read and it really can prepare you well for emergency situations in your um, in your center. So we're just thrilled to have her today and what a timely topic. Uh, for those of you that are joining us from the East Coast, we're definitely thinking about you and hoping that you're crawling out from the uh, the ravage of Hurricane Florence. Um, and, and then for everybody else, this really does shed light on why this topic is so important and why it's so important to prepare for emergencies. But before we get to our exciting topic of the day uh, and Sonia Wilson, we're going to start off today um, with our president, Anna Torres Radel, and she's going to tell us a little bit about PAC, kind of the who, what, and where. So Anna, if you want to get us started. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say, Thank you, Jesse, for pulling all this together also, because I am one of those East Coasters. We're here in Maryland, and we are getting uh, hit today with what's left of the storm. So we have um, been, we've been page turning through all this book, trying to make sure we we're ready for the storm that's now this <laughs> So So um, yeah, so I'm so happy we had the book, and we, because we were prepared, we're not getting much, so we're lucky. But I um, just want to go back to, to thank everyone for joining us. And for those of you who are not so familiar with PAC, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about it. The founders of PAC, um, Susan Briggs and Charlotte Biggs, set out to elevate our industry to the next level. This is not a totally new idea to the pet care industry. Vet techs have an independent certification. Dog trainers have independent certification. But pet boarding, pet sitting, and daycare don't. Perhaps one of the most pressing reasons to continue this mission is that the pet care industry is under heavy scrutiny, as many of you have seen, tons and tons of articles. It takes one bad story to just go viral. And so what we, we've seen is a lot of local legislators seeking to apply more rules and regulations on the pet care providers. With independent certification, together we can show them how much pet safety means to true pet care professionals. We need to set our standards before outsiders come in and do it for us. So where did it all begin? Well, a group of industry leaders got together in 2015 in Denver to discuss the idea of third-party certification. This is something that they hadn't ever done before in our pet industry. Um, there have been certificates of completion, many of those, and many fabulous educational programs, but third-party independent certification by nonprofit is completely different. These two ladies you see on your screen right here are Charlotte Biggs and Susan Briggs. Many of you know them from their participation in several organizations um, with our industry. Most recently, um, Charlotte was CEO of IBPSA, and Susan, of course, is one of the famous dog gurus. So um, they obviously have this genuine passion for making pet care centers safer places for pets and safer places for the people in them. So this is the passion that drove them to take on the huge task of making PAC a reality. And what an achievement. So here we are three years later, and we have the creation of three different testing levels, almost 114, not almost, we have 114 certified pet care professionals, Charlotte counted them this morning, that are on, then we are about to enter our sixth testing cycle. So this is really a huge achievement for us and we're super, super excited to get the word out. Um, but the success of PAC is dependent on our volunteers. So if you share our passion for this mission, get involved, please. We're only gonna take a few minutes to talk about PAC, but when you're done, take a minute, look at our website, look at our Facebook and find out how you can get involved. We'll be at the IBPSA conference and we'll be there to answer all your questions. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that summary, Anna. And as she mentioned, um, you know, PAC is, is a huge idea of, um, 
and lots of different moving parts, whether you want to take the exam and get certified or you just want to learn more and become a volunteer, we welcome everyone's participation. So please feel free uh, to reach out. So as Anna mentioned, uh, the, the true kind of center, the pillar of PAC is getting pet care professionals independently certified. So that means you gain your experience and you gain your knowledge uh, however you want to, whether you're using certain books or certain resources that are available in the industry, just like all other professions, you obtain your knowledge independently and then you'll sit for this exam. And it's going to just verify uh, each of our knowledge and our qualifications to care for pets and to keep them safe. In addition, it's not just about taking the test one time. Uh, it requires you to continue your education over the years, making sure we stay up to date on how the industry changes and grows because it is changing and growing very rapidly. So you will maintain uh, CEUs to keep the certification and to ensure your proficiency as the years go by. And for those of you that are PAC certified, um, we're happy to announce that today's presentation does actually count for half a CEU credit, um, and we will be providing that code um, for the end of the presentation, so stay tuned for that. Um, there are three certification levels with PAC. You don't have to have all three. Choose kind of where you are in your career. Is it the beginning of your career? You're spending most of your time with the animals, caring for the animals, then we have the provider level exam. If you're a manager, kind of running the day-to-day -day operations of a pet care center, the manager level exam might be more appropriate for you. And then for those of you that have been in the industry for five years or more, you own your own center, your own pet care business, uh, or you operate it, um, maybe you don't necessarily own it, but you are in charge of the daily operations and overseeing the business, the operator level exam might be more appropriate for you. We're going to go, if there's time at the end, we're going to go into those a little bit more. Um, but I know everybody's here to see Sonia, so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for her. But those are the three certification levels, and you choose which one is best for you at this point in your career. As Anna mentioned, it's all about elevating our industry and ensuring that we're providing the safest care for animals. Um, and that is really what it all boils down to, is that the animals in our care return home safely each and every time. Why is PAC important to your business? Why should you care about PAC? Most professions have a certification such as this. So if we're going to elevate our industry and really take it to the next level, independent certification is a critical aspect of that. In addition, as I mentioned, our industry is changing and growing. There is so much competition these days. Competition can come everywhere from uh, your local big box store uh, down the street your neighbor can even be your competition now with the online um, dog offerings uh, that are available. So there is a ton of competition. Getting a PAC certification can really make you stand out from the crowd. Being able to share with pet owners in your area that you are knowledgeable and that, that it has been independently tested it's a great thing to put in your marketing, to share on your customer tours, or when you're going to visit your pet sitting customers for the first time. This is a powerful thing that you can share with them, that you are dedicated to having that higher level of education and knowledge. If you're an owner listening to this webinar, it's also a fantastic way to confirm knowledge and skills from your employees. I know that once we started putting in formal training into our pet care center, my blood pressure went way down because I knew that my employees had the skills that they need to keep the pets safe. So it really can be, if you're an owner, uh, allow you to know that your employees have what they need. And it allows you to recruit higher level employees. If you're going to um, put some effort into them and help them grow their career, you're going to find that you attract a higher level uh, staff member. Why it's important to your team? Pet 
care can be a real career, not just for people that own pet care centers, but also for people that work in pet care centers. And PAC will really, a PAC certification will really legitimize pet care as a career. So we think it's really important to have high level staff to have this certification and really help those that want a career in pet care be able to develop that and have a career path kind of laid out for them. Why is it important to pet parents? I am shocked every day by some of the decisions that my friends, that my family make when it comes to pet care. To us, because we're in pet care, um, you know, we think a lot of things are obvious, but they're really not. Um, my sister-in-law, her dog escaped from a pet care center and, and she didn't think that was you know, way out of the uh, range of possibility and things that should happen. Um, and of course, accidents do happen. They happen to all of us. But it, it's amazing of the, the lack of knowledge with many pet parents. So PAC will really allow them a safe place to find pet care. Who is taking their pet care business and elevating it to the next level to ensure that that everyone on staff is certified and knowledgeable. So it's a really fantastic thing for pet parents. In terms of our marketing efforts, that's, that's where we're gonna be focused on in the next few years, is educating the public on what PAC certification is and why it's so important to look for. The certification doesn't mean a whole lot if the public isn't familiar with it. So we've already started these efforts in, in making pet parents more aware of why this is important. So stay tuned for that. Okay, now the, uh, the, the speaker of the day, what everyone has been waiting for, uh, Sonia Wilson, who is a certified provider with PAC, has agreed to join us. And, you know, we are on a mission for increased pet safety. And that is why we're going to start doing these webinars uh, now that we have a big uh, pool of certified providers and it's growing every single day, we want to stick to our mission and give you all the information that you need to keep pets safe. And Sonia has agreed to be our, our guinea pig here, very first guest presenter uh, with PAC, and we are just thrilled. The timing couldn't be better. There's so many people thinking about this topic right now, um, and we're just really thrilled to have her. Um, as Anna mentioned, if you have not read her book, uh, you know, grab a grab a uh, a blanket and sit down with it, and it will it will really open your eyes to, um, you know, not just the scary stuff, but this how you can prepare for it. So things get a lot less scary once you you are prepared. So I'm going to switch it over to Sonia here. Change presenter, Sonia. I'm passing it over to you. And so just remember to accept that. And then I'll let you know when we can see your presentation. You should be able to see it now. We can see it. And Charlotte, you might have to chime in here, but it's a little bit small. I'm seeing a full screen. Uh, what you might want to yeah. do is look okay. at your viewing. Uh, there's a box that presents itself. You can stretch that to the size that you want on Got your it. screen. Got it. Okay. okay. Very good. And if you're having any issues with seeing the screen, Sonia's presentation, just, just type into the questions box or the chat box. And Sonia, we will deliver it over to you. Thank you. I appreciate being uh, chosen to be the, the guinea pig of the present presentations. And uh, hopefully this is not a guinea pig type presentation, but one that you can use the knowledge from to take away and begin to put together your own facilities disaster plan. When I started putting mine together, it was because it was the result of several hairy situations that I had run into throughout the years. And I realized that I could not legitimately call myself a pet professional unless I had the confidence of my, um, of my clients and part of building the confidence of my clients was to put together a disaster plan that made a lot of difference. I have clients that come to me because I have one, because I know what's going to happen when X, Y, Z happens. Uh, they feel more confident leaving their animals with me. This is not only appropriate because of the 
disaster that's happening on the East Coast, but coincidentally, September is Disaster Preparedness Month. So it, this is the month to get started. Last month was the month to get started. Last year was the year to get started. So um, it's, it's too late once something has happened, but it's never too late to start before you have the problem. So don't let not having started yet prevent you from starting. And it doesn't have to be all in, all, all at once. You could start little by little. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I can move my, if I can expand. I can't move my screen, Charlotte. I'm looking to see why that might happen. Um, you're showing your screen. You are the presenter. Okay, let me see. Okay, so Jess, do you have a little circle on your on your go to go to webinar box that says "Give keyboard and mouse"? I do, but it's not highlighted. Okay. Um, you may have to use your uh, your touchpad. Are you using a mouse or a touchpad? I have a mouse. Okay. Oh, Sonia? Yes. Sonia? Yes. Do you have a touchpad? Yes. Try moving it with that. Just push enter. Yes, I'm trying. It's there. I'll have to pull up a, a slide every time, uh, I'll pull up a pull screen every time. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I opened the first cage-free canine daycare in Austin in 2002. I think that there were several around before that, but uh, we decided early on that we were going to be um, free range that the dogs were going to stay in their groups and not be crated throughout the day in and out. Uh, so they they go in and out throughout the day and play in their play groups. Uh, as everybody has said, I wrote Harry situations. And I actually used it to write my plan as I was writing the book. So everything's been tested uh, that's in the book. Um, tested and reviewed, and uh, I was inspired to write it not only by the problems that I had faced, but my industry cheerleaders, Charlotte and Susan, um, sort of encouraged me to become the writer that I you know, already was. I was putting things out into the, into the ether and um, without any formal plan of putting it together. And they both encouraged me in their own ways to put everything together and, and get it all in one place. And that's what I've done. I was amongst the first um, testees in the CPACP and the, um, in the PACCC testing program. And I, if you haven't done it yet, I highly, highly recommend it. If you're signed up for it for the next session, I think the deadline is September the 30th. Get get signed up. It's it's not an easy test, and uh, it's a challenging test. But I feel better. My clients love seeing the certifications that we earn on our wall because we proudly proclaim them. Um, and I took it a step further, and I'm also a NAPS certified pet sitter. I I maintain professional um, memberships in several organizations across all of the things that I do because I think it's important to have knowledge. And the knowledge that I gain from these memberships is invaluable to my business. It It far exceeds the membership cost. So I suggest that if you don't have professional memberships, that you join and see the return on your investment that you will get. Let's, there you go. Now I got it. Whether you call it a crisis, 
an emergency, a disaster, whatever level it happens to be, if you're not in front of it, if you're not prepared for it, it's going to get the better of you. A lot of small things can put you out of business. For example, there was a uh, the the subject of kennel cough and canine cough is more appropriate title for it. The subject of canine cough has been coming up quite a bit on the discussion boards that I'm on. And there actually has been at least one, probably more than one, kennel that completely closed forever because they couldn't get a handle on canine cough. They couldn't educate their clients to the point that they weren't losing them as their dogs came down with canine cough. They couldn't get their facility uh, free of it and um, set up a process by which they excluded dogs that were coughing. That's a disaster that you would have to close your entire business because you didn't get a handle on, you didn't have a plan for dealing with that what should have been a minor crisis, a blip in the road became the end of the road for them. And I don't want that to happen to anybody else. So you can see in the background that I have the, uh, the uh, cartoon sounds, uh, you know, crash, bang, boom. Usually when I hear those sounds in my facility, I say this which is not a nice thing to say, but I have said this way less often now that I have my, uh, my disaster plan in place. I'm not constantly worrying about what's going on. I'm able to let go and trust my staff to follow the procedures that we've put together. Now, I'm going to spend just a few minutes going through a few crisis that happened in real life. And I want you to think about whether or not this has happened to you and whether or not you have a plan for it. Because some of these are pretty simple and some of them happen way more often than you think they do. Fire is the number one crisis that we should be worrying about because it happens more often than you would think. Um, it's one of the top five disasters that hit uh, boarding facilities, that hit um, pet industry um, members. So you always have to be prepared for what would happen in a fire. Do you have a do you have a plan? Do you have a fire extinguisher? Do you have a a, a notification system so that if you're away from the kennel, you you know immediately if something's wrong. The people in this situation lost quite a few animals across several buildings, and they had a plan. They had a, pre a preparation. The problem is that they did not follow their plan, that they let it get, they let the crisis get ahead of them. They ended up closing permanently. This business was also put out of business permanently because they didn't, not because their building flooded, not because they lost um, clients, because they didn't, all the animals got out fine. This was a dam break. What happened was their paper copies were ruined and their electronic copies of their paper copies were in the building and got flooded and ruined. So because they had no no way of uh, recalling any of those records, they closed their business. Everybody has seen the blue screen of death and hopefully it hasn't happened to very many people. It's happened to me about three times and now I have multiple computers set up the same exact way and sitting there waiting for me in case I in case something happens, I can just go plug in another computer. I don't, um, I don't rely on one set of hardware anymore. I've, um, I've outgrown that. 
but just recently, one of the major pet uh, pet software uh, management uh, programs went down for days, and there were people who were not taking reservations, that were not checking dogs out, that were not able to collect money because they didn't have their software system and they didn't have a backup. They didn't have even paper and pencil was too hard of a system to keep up with because they hadn't done it before. They hadn't taken their system offline and practiced it so that they could keep up with it. So you can, uh, the smallest thing can turn into a major crisis. Some of these people lost thousands of dollars over the course of this week, and they have no recourse because of the agreements that they signed. So it's up to all of us to make sure that we are covering ourselves, covering our own bases. It, nobody else is going to take care of us. We've got to do it on our own, our own dime. Employees are always, always, always going to be an issue, whether it's not having enough, not having the right ones, having too many, having drama, whatever it is, you're going to need to, to have policies and procedures in place to deal with that. And um, hopefully you won't have your help wanted sign out for very long. In today's society, there's a very, very low um, incident of unemployment. And so I'm hearing that people are walking off the job. Uh, most pet, pet businesses have a yearly, um, the average of overturn of turn, turnover with employees is about 200%. And that's crazy. You want to keep employees. We all know that this is not going to be uh, for your entry level employees, this is not going to be their career, but try to plan for their involvement in the business. The more the more involved they get in planning and day to day and the the events of what goes on, and the more they're they're the more interested they are in helping your business succeed the better off you're going to be and the longest, the longer you're going to have them. Of course, there's always those of us that have had employees for multiple years, but those are the employees that are engaged and interested in the success of your business. Injuries are going to happen with employees, with yourself. You need to be careful. We take care of animals and animals have sharp teeth and sharp claws and we need to make sure our animal handling skills um, down before we put employees in with animals that could hurt them this could turn into a workers comp issue this could turn into a serious lawsuit issue it depends on how the person who owns the facility handles it and a lot of it is what kind of situ what the situation was and how serious the injury is but employees are going to get injured and we need to have a plan for how we take care of that when it happens we were just talking about a dog that escaped earlier and how the the client didn't think that that was a huge deal this dog indicated by the red arrow is on its way out the front door notice that it's on a security camera it's been on a security camera as it went through three doors this door was its fourth door it had gotten out of its kennel the first security door the second security door and then it went out the front door so and the whole time there were employees in the building and the dog was on a security camera. That may be a training issue. It may be a it may be a uh, a reconfiguring the building issue. But that's the kind of thing that we're going to be thinking through as we walk through our buildings and put together our disaster plans. Pet injuries are also 
um, something we try to avoid as much as possible. We can't have everybody walking around in Elizabethan collars and bubble wrap, but we want to make sure that we have our our groups put together correctly. We want to make sure that we have our safety plans in place, and we want to make sure that we minimize our impact on our dogs. Our, our animal safety is the top priority at South Paws, and as it is with everybody who's listening to me, I know that I'm preaching to the choir. This, a, a pet injury can be minimal and can cause a huge problem. Um, it can be a, a huge injury and cause a minimal problem. It depends on the client and the dog and how you handle it. If you don't have a plan and you haven't thought through it, you're not going to be able to to deal with it in, in the appropriate manner. Canine influenza, um, giardia, all kind. Di um, I've heard of distemper going through kennels. Um, we make sure that we have our protocols in place and our safety measures in place and our disaster plan in place so that if these things do happen at our facility, we know what we're going to do. We're not spending time putting together a plan at the last minute. And then, of course, all of those things that are negative add up to negative Yelp reviews. I heard somebody yesterday using Yelp as a verb. I'm going to Yelp you. Well, yes, a lot of people Yelp people um, Yelp us when they're not happy. Not not that many Yelp us when they are happy. So um, not that we should be slaves to our reviews, but we should pay attention to our online presence and how we are perceived online. So if I haven't scared you yet, I'm sorry, I wasn't working hard enough. I intended to scare everybody that's watching this. Yes, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I'm hoping that you're thinking back on something that may have happened in your past and and putting your disaster plan as a high priority in your um, to-do list. Because it won't happen to me is not a plan. Really, it's not a plan. I want to make sure that you have a plan and you never have to use it. That is my goal. Because a lot of times, if you have everything written down, like was said earlier, it's it becomes a non-issue. You've already thought it through, so therefore you've prepared for it. Therefore, it doesn't happen at your place. That's the whole that is the whole point of a disaster plan is that not only do you have what you're going to do written down and you're you've prepared and trained for it, but that you also can prevent a lot of things from happening because you are prepared. Now listen to this. I'm I'm going to read it because I um I don't have it memorized. Many businesses that face crisis on even a small scale will close, at least temporarily. Some will never reopen. Think about all those businesses that closed during Hurricane Sandy that never reopened. And I'm sure that's going to happen now with Hurricane Florence. Some of these businesses have been hit so hard that they that they are just completely unable to reopen. Those that reopen without a crisis plan have an even greater chance of closing permanently. So if you do, if you are able to scramble and reopen, but you don't put together a crisis plan at that point, your, your chances of closing within the year are exponentially greater. So if you did have to close, the first thing on your list needs to be putting your plan together. If you stop doing business during a crisis, it is likely that you will lose customers that ne may never be regained. 
on my street, there are four dog daycare, five dog daycares right now. So if I close because of a, uh, because of a crisis that affects only me, I can guarantee you that my everyday clients are going to go down the street. If they go down the street and they find a better or it's just more convenient, they're not going to come back to me. So my goal is to not close, is to work through all of the crisis that we're going to, um, that we possibly can work through. Some of them you're going to have to close. You can't, you can't have daycare or you can't have boarding with six feet of water in your building. But you can avoid those situations to a certain extent so that you don't have to close down. Businesses that have a crisis plan and are prepared for disaster have a much better chance of staying open and even thriving than businesses who expect to be successful flying by the seat of their pants. Worrying where the money is going to come from, worrying where the how am I going to find my insurance documents, worrying about whether the insurance is going to pay off or whether you're even covered. It's an issue if you have all of your information together and you can go put your fingertips on it. It's such a relieving thing. I sleep better at night every night that I uh, close this business at night. I sleep better every night knowing that I have all of my processes in place. So you hear now that there are uh, there are benefits in having a written crisis plan. It's much easier to think and plan when you're not under stress, just like we've been talking about. You sleep better at night. Everybody's uh, continued to care for, and they're not put in danger. And then you can be self-reliant. And if you can be self, if you want to be self-reliant, here are the things that you need to do today. You need to write down these plans and you need to start working on them. The first one is fiscal readiness. You need to make sure that you have cash on hand, that you have a, uh, a surplus that you can rely on if you have income that's not coming in. You need to make sure that you have all of your plans in place if something happens to you, um, that your business will continue if that's what you want to happen. You need to make sure that you are physically ready. If you're in a floodplain and you don't have a plan for evacuating your animals, you are asking to have a problem when something happens. So you need to make sure that you are physically ready. I personally hoard crates. When somebody brings me a crate, I have an entire shed that only has crates in it. I have enough crates for every dog in my facility. And because we're crate free, I don't, I don't have them out all over the place. I have them in a shed ready to be put together in case I have to leave. And um, I, have, uh, I have agreements with other uh, pet facilities. I have an agreement with um, the people next door to me that I can stage my crates and put the dogs in the crates in their parking lot if I need to so that I can get the dogs. They have a, um, a circular driveway so that I can get clients in to pick up their animals if I have to evacuate them from my building. The third thing that you need to do is data backup. You need to have everything that's on your computer or in your files. If you have paper files, you need to have them on a thumb drive, on a disk, on a hard drive, and you need to have them stored away from your building. Remember the vet that had to close because of the, of the problem with his, his data. His paper copies were ruined, and his data backup was not backed up off site. So that's one really important thing. It's so easy to back up everything to the cloud today. Um, 
there are multiple uh, multiple uh, companies that handle this for you. I personally use Carbonite. I I don't I don't have experience with other companies, so I can't say whether I I do recommend them because I use them and because I haven't had any problem with them at all recovering documents if I happen to uh, if I happen to lose something I fried a thumb drive uh, and I was able to because I had that thumb drive backed up I was able to get all my files back believe it or not I left a thumb drive in the Detroit airport and if any of you live in Detroit go look for a Scooby-Doo thumb drive please if you're there because that I didn't have backed up and I have had to recreate all of my files. That was one of my hairy situations. And I I learned really quickly that if I wanted to cry and tear my hair out, that that's exactly what I needed to do is keep all my information on thumb drives that are very, um, they're easily lost. You need to write, have everything documented. You need to have your processes documented. If you're not there to show someone new how to um, mix the chemicals to mop the floor, you need to have it written down. If, if you have, um, you need to have an employee manual. You need to have everybody be able to go to the manual and look up what their issues are. You need to have everybody familiar with your disaster plans and in order to get everybody familiar with them those processes have to be written down that's really really important in fact i would tell you that a disaster plan is more important than your employee manual so if you are working on both of them at the same time finish your documentation for your disaster plan first because when i was writing mine a lot of what was in my disaster plan dictated how I wrote my employee manual and what I included in it um, so that I wasn't having to go back and forth and say, oh, I need to add this in my disaster plan. I had it all in my disaster plan, and then I was able to put together my employee manual without going back and forth. It was very helpful. Insurance is so critical in this industry. We all have to keep in mind that this is a this is an industry that is based on our clients' disposable income. They don't have to come to a groomer. They can do it at home. They don't have to get their dogs washed. They can do it at home. They don't have to have daycare. They can arrange something at home. So because we need to realize that. And, and realize that our insurance may be the difference between us staying open and, and having to close our doors because we can't always rely on our clients coming back if the entire community was affected by a disaster. Um, and I highly recommend, I recommend is uh, business interruption insurance that has no waiting period and that depends on uh, that, that you already have all your documentation for the in, income for your last year and your year before that so that you can document the income that you're losing. Um, that insurance check may be what you're depending on. You may not have enough of a cash, um, a cash reserve put together and you may have to wait for that insurance to come through. So if that's the case, you need to make sure that you have everything insured that you possibly can. So once you've got it all written, once you've got these steps taken, what do you do next? And you have to train. You have to train your employees and you have to train your clients. You cannot just and let it sit on a shelf. You have to let everybody know that there is a disaster plan and that you have to let them know what's in the disaster plan. We don't want to be this dog, uh, this group of dogs. We don't want to actually leave it to our pets to follow the disaster plan. Um, I love that 
I love that cartoon because it is exactly what so many people do. It, we're going to do two steps, and that's it. That's all we're going to do. Um, and I, I don't want that to happen. I want I want everybody to be trained in what they can um, what they can pass off. You pass off. You cross train your employees. You give them um, you give them ownership of the tasks that are going on in your disaster plan, and you train them. Um, so that they know pet first aid, they know human first aid. Minor crises that go on in your business on day to day don't close you down. With your clients, they need to be trained in pet first aid. You can always encourage them to do that. Um, have a train, have a trainer come in and and train your employees all at once. Require at at our facility, our employees don't touch our animals until they are trained in pet first aid. Um, because I want to know, I want them to know how they can avoid some of the problems that show up in a pet first aid class. And they can't do that if they're already hands on before they know how to avoid things. Um, I want you to encourage your clients and your employees to be personally prepared to have everything put together in their own homes and have their own disaster plans. Because if they can't, if your employees can't, aren't prepared, they can't show up for work to help you. You have a, a major disaster happen. And I want you to train your clients to never leave your pets at home. That is, uh, um, that is, a, uh, human disasters become pet disasters when clients just leave and leave their pets thinking that they're going to come back and get them. It's, it's, um, it's just heart wrenching. So you've done all these things. You're properly scared and you've already started making notes about what you're going to do. What I want you to remember is that emergency planning is a continuous process. Your document for your disaster plan, as well as your employee manual, as well as, well as your standard operating procedures, they're going to be live documents. You're going to be making notes and plans and re revisiting those documents on a regular basis. You're going to be revisiting your disaster stockpile on a regular basis, trading out um, outdated products and putting in new products. You can't go to a two-year-old disaster kit and expect batteries to work or expect um, any of your products to be in date and be usable if you um, so that's what's going to happen if you just put it together and say I've got it and leave it alone. Make sure that you have somebody designated to take care of that on a regular basis and then that way delegating it becomes something you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about doing this on your own. You have a team utilize them. So all this boils down to is that you have the ability to affect your pet care business's bottom line with the work that you put into a comprehensive day, um, disaster plan. You will pull in clients because you have a disaster plan, because they know that you care about their animals, and because you, you don't have employee turnover every time something happens in your, in your business. Everybody doesn't go crazy trying to solve the problem. And that stress is what causes a lot of employee turnover. If your employees are trained and they know what to do and you're tr you've trained yourself and you know what to do, then you're going to be able to concentrate on working on your business instead of in your business. And you actually will increase your um your investment. Every dollar that you invest in putting together your disaster plan will come back to you multiplied. multiplied. So please make sure that you put all of this together. If not for any of the reasons that I've talked about, put it together for the money. Because it does come once you get your um, your disaster plan together. I can tell you that for um, definitely. I um, I've gotten a lot of clients because of crisis in other 
uh, in other facilities, not actively searching for them, not actively going out and recruiting them. But if I, I know the facility they came from and I know why they came to me. So uh, you will increase your client list, you will increase your income, you will increase your, um, your peace of mind. So make sure that you, um, that you start your disaster plan or go and polish it if you have one already. I want to leave you with this statement because this is why I do what I do. I have the in, I have the good fortune to be the precious lives of animals, and so I have a responsibility to live up to that trust, to make the animals be as safe as possible, to make the humans have as much peace of mind as possible the humans that belong to these animals. And I have a responsibility for my employees and myself. So I want to be sure that I live up to that trust. And the way that I live up to that trust is by having my plans in place, by having my details in place, and by having a, a continual, um, by having a continuous, uh, a continuation plan so let's make sure that we um that we take care of the things that are most important to us thank you i appreciate you listening i could talk about this all day and if you want to be contacted if you want to contact me i will um get back to you uh, um pretty quickly thank you i appreciate it let me send this over to the person that I'm supposed to send it over to you. Can, you can actually just leave this on there, Sonia, because I think okay. um, we'll just have a few questions. Okay. Um, so we are available to take questions. We've got a few minutes here at the end. Um, while Charlotte kind of peeks through the comments, I just, Sonia, this information is just so fantastic. Um, and it really does align so well with what we're trying to do at PAC, um, which is elevate the industry and make pet care centers safer places to be. Um, and this is just a great first presentation to kick off these, um, these series of webinars because this is um, just really making your pet care center um, a professional uh, place, a safe place for pets to be. This information um, is just fantastic. And one thing I just want to re reiterate just from a, a realistic perspective, um, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, you, you know, this is a project you should have started a day ago, six months ago, a year ago. Um, it can be overwhelming. I know when I began the project, it was pretty overwhelming to think about everything. But, um, you know, I, I won't forget the day that I, I started reading your book, something in my head. Um, you know, I, I put the book down immediately, went across to my pet care center, and we had fire extinguishers everywhere in our pet care center, prominently displayed on the wall. Um, but if you asked one of my employees, hey, where's the fire extinguisher, even though it was right there, they couldn't, they just, it, it just blended into everything. So, you know, even that day, I remember thinking, okay, we've gotten started because I went around and, and we all looked at the fire extinguishers to identify and bring to light. This is not just something that sits on the wall. So it just goes to show you know, you got to start somewhere and sometimes it's just pointing at the big red thing that's been on your wall for two years and making exactly. aware of it. And uh, that's part of my, that is part of my onboarding um, situation. They get shown all of that and shown how to use a fire extinguisher on the first day they're employed. Yes, yes. Just, just okay. really great information that, that sparks things. Um, it was very comprehensive. Charlotte, are you seeing anything that needs um, any um, final questions? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, so a question here, and you may have just done that, but uh, can you please elaborate on how best to ensure that your staff is ready for a disaster so that they can be ready to help out, to help out with that work? So, so there is a, a really, really good, uh, a, pro a program through FEMA. It's called Animals and Disasters, and there's two modules for it. And I highly recommend that you and all of your employees be become certified in those two modules. There is also 
a um, a really good brochure that you can order from FEMA free of charge that walks you through getting your employees, getting your um, your clients, and getting personally prepared at your own home. So um, I, I recommend that. I recommend handing those brochures to your clients. I recommend sending them home with your employees. And you know what? It doesn't hurt to say to um, to entice your employees to get personally prepared by saying, "All right, you show me pictures of your personal preparation, and I am going to hand you a gift card." Mm-hmm. Great idea. Yeah. If that the if that's the way that that it works at your facility, that's that's excellent. Um, I also engage my. Uh, my employees in the planning in the actual planning who wants to be in charge of this who can who can handle coming in at uh, at a moment's notice who has and I keep track of I, I know you can't do it for HR reasons but you can keep track of who has small children and can't respond at a moment's notice you need to keep that in the back of your head because putting those people on you know, the first responders list is going to be a futile, uh, a futile exercise. Uh, Sonia, the uh, question is the FEMA brochures or modules called animals and disasters? Animals in disaster. Okay. Okay. That was just a question confirming that those were the modules. You are correct. Right. Yes. So Charlotte, I wanted to shout out the uh, continuing education number because I know we're approaching the end of our time and we could definitely stay on a few extra minutes. But the, the, the code that you need for your continuing education number is C as in cat, C as in cat, 170051. I'll repeat that one more time. C as in cat, C as in cat, 170051. Excellent. Excellent. For those of you who are certified with that code, you can get a half a credit, half CEU unit for having attended this webinar. Um, Charlotte, and somebody's asking if you can type that into the questions box. Is that possible? I can. It's C is in cat, C is in cat. Tell me again. Oh, C is in cat, C is in cat, 170051. 51. Send to all. Um, so there is a question. Um, where can they find your book? The, I am going to uh, give an, the IBPSA the first plug for that. If, okay. you, uh, if you use Kindle, you can get the Kindle version on IBPSA for a discount. And part of the money that is... Um, that is spent on the book goes straight to IBPSA. Oh, great. So it helps to support them. You can find it on Dogwise. You can find it on uh, Amazon. You can find it, uh, it, that's in both versions, both places. Um, and you can find it on uh, my website. You can email me and I'll, um, I'll send that to you, um, okay. send the information to you. I have two. Great. And the other thing, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, there was two more quick questions. Go ahead. One, one is that animals in disaster, also the FEMA brochures, and are they free? Can you pass yes, them? Yes, they are free. You okay. can get two hundred at a time. Okay. I use, I hand them out to my clients uh, at strategic times through the through the year. Uh, usually, I'll attach it to a vet release form, my emergency vet release form, and uh, hand it out as a little packet. March is. Uh, Pet First Aid Month, and September is Disaster Preparedness Month, so we usually do our handouts in those two months to get all of our clients, and um, and I hand them out in my first aid classes also to make sure that everybody is uh, personally prepared. And, and you find those on the FEMA website, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then one more question. Um, how do you get your employees to volunteer to help during emergencies? For example, for this person, they're on the East Coast. Many of our staff are reluctant to drive in the snow. Have a vehicle that can come and get them. 
Yes. And and I'll, I'll just do a si- I'll just do a side note. Um, I had employees who volunteered to be to do emergencies with me if it came up, but I also had neighbors. They were clients who I knew had mm-hmm. vans and large vehicles, and I'd said, I- "If we need help, would you help us?" Because of mm-hmm. that that Bastrop fire that we had, would you help us evacuate? And yeah. so we reached out to neighbors as well. I have a I have a first responder team yeah. of clients, and they have been given the um, we have them on our emergency uh, our emergency uh, release our uh, when when clients sign in can uh, that I can South Paws can can uh, send your animal home with somebody, and we keep really good track of where the animals went we will if we have that disaster come up but my first responders have all been given a a pet first aid class free of charge they all have that they are able to leave work at a moment's notice and they all live within two or three miles of our facility Mm, that's great that's great advice sonia one last comment um uh, you put the first throw out to IBPSA. If someone's not an IBPSA member, they can become one. But you're also on Amazon. Is that correct? I am also on Amazon. Okay. That's that's okay. the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, like I said, this just aligns with PAC's mission so much. We're so grateful to Sonia for being here today. Um, if this is a community that you want to be a bigger part of, as we mentioned, volunteers are always welcome. Um, so please uh, visit our web- website um, for more information. In addition, if you're interested in taking the PAC exam, um, uh, Sonia, you did have the date right. Uh, the <laughs> deadline to register is actually September 30th. And the registration process, um, it does involve uh, providing um, a couple of forms and identification. So it's not something you can go to uh, at eight o'clock at night on September 30th and complete. So if it's something that you're interested in, take a look at that today. And then that does give you time to study because the exam, uh, the exam window uh, for that is October 27th to November 10th. So just because you register at the, in September, you do have a month, six weeks to study for it. Um, so please go take a look at that. Again, it's all about the safety of the pets, the safety of the people that work in these pet care centers. Um, any final thoughts, Sonia or Charlotte, before I close this out? Uh, there's just one additional comment from Ben Day, sure. and he's a uh, an emergency expert as well with IBPSA and insurance mm-hmm. person. And he just said not to forget about the risk insurance issue that you may have with requiring staff to come in on ice or something like that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, uh, that that requiring them to is a is a touchy issue. So mm-hmm. okay, so mm-hmm. just just sharing that. That was the last of the comments in the question. Yep. Okay, and that, and that, that's very valid. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that's what we can all research during our preparation, yes, right? We do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. It was fantastic. If you have any additional questions, um, please feel free. Everyone's going to get the contact info. This has been recorded as well. So if you have friends that you think could benefit from this or you want your employees to watch it, look for that recording link uh, and and, uh, you can view it again or you can send it on to people. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you so much, Charlotte, Anna, for joining us. And thank you to all the attendees.